So we have a full house today. We have Mark, Blake, Brando, and Gavin all here, and they are our core cameramen, pre-production, on-set experts. Is that your official title? Did I get that right? At least three of those things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of you here, and I want to make sure we know who's who. So why don't we go just introduce yourself, your name, where you're located more or less, and like your favorite on-set meal. Because oh. like when I'm on set, I just, I need like a perfect turkey sandwich. I just can't oh, even explain. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. it has to happen. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Cool. <clears throat> hey, I'm Gavin. I am Easter Coast Chicago representative. And I guess my favorite on set meal usually is lighter. I don't like having a heavy meal because I still have to be on my feet. So probably like, to be honest, a turkey sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hello, my name is Blake Newhouse. I'm a videographer editor here at Ishko. My favorite on-set meal would have to be pizza. Nice. Hi, my name is Mark. I am a videographer and editor here in Ishko. I am based in DC. And my favorite meal on set is a hamburger. Ooh. Hi, my name is Brando. I'm based in DC. And I am a videographer, photographer, and I dabble a little bit in art direction and producing here at Estrico. My favorite meal on set is pretty much any vegetarian meal. Um, so a good salad or a veggie burger or something like that. It's always nice when they, they think about the vegetarian side. Think of the vegetarians. Wings. Really, you don't you don't just get your nutrition from hitting the record button like I do every time I get them. It's like 10 calories right there. <laughs> or however many calories is a reasonable amount. Obviously, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 10, calories. 10 calories? Yeah, I don't know, dude. <laughs> I went to movie college, not science college. <laughs> <laughs> First off, it's all exciting when you guys show up and you bring in all the expensive, cool equipment and set up all the fancy lighting. But I think a lot of clients, first off, do not realize that nothing can happen without a sense of pre-production, a sense of the space, a sense of deliverables, a sense of what you're doing. So is there like an ideal first question or first step you have when you hear just that you have a film day coming up? Yeah, I feel like usually I want to know what they're looking for in terms of what their measure for success will be, what kind of space we have available for ourselves, and what how much time we'll have. I know those are three questions, but they all are sort of interrelated. Uh, it just has to do with how long we'll have with the subject, what the day's even going to look like in terms of what we're capturing. And, you know, that's where it all starts. And what do you want? What do you want this video to be? I think there's a really, really big difference between a video that you're just going to put on Instagram Reels and a video that you might want to circulate uh, internally, online, on your CDN of choice like YouTube or Vimeo. You know, there's a million questions to ask, but it all comes down to what are you even looking for? I like that answer a lot. I also think just in conjunction with that, the audience as well as the platform so that you can figure out the emotional component of how you're trying to see your message be be viewed. Yeah, I agree with both answers. And I also feel that um, equipment follows with what story that we are filming. I tend to backlight all the time. It gives me the freedom to choose smaller equipments and be versatile. And I know, especially for documentary work, uh, it's important to, to be on your feet all the time and, and move fast. So I feel, I feel for me, I, I, I give more importance to that. Yeah, actually, I would love to hear a little bit more about that because, you know, there's the basic, you obviously need tripods and lighting and the mics, but what triggers you saying, oh, I should bring my gimbal or my slider? What kind of stuff makes you think like, oh, I shouldn't pack light and I should bring this extra stuff along? I'd say there's like a lot of like technological advancement nowadays, like compared to like five, to seven years ago. Where if you have a gimbal and a camera and a small audio equipment, you can do what five people could do five years ago. And it's much easier now. I feel that there's always a way nowadays to, there's always a solution to make things easier. And that's the key, I think, moving forward. To work smarter, not harder. To work, yeah, to work smarter, not harder. 
I keep thinking about LED lights. Like that's the big thing that always like pops into my head when you talk about how things have changed. I mean, that's more of like a 10 plus years change, right? But oh, yeah. like LED lights used to be so ugly <laughs> and mm-hmm. you could never hold a candle to like a nice tungsten Fresnel. And now like with some of the lights that we're bringing on to set for Istrico, like these are awesome lights that can achieve a really high level of brightness, really pretty light quality that really flatters the subjects. And it's not hot. Like we don't have to worry about bringing a bunch of like cornstarch makeup to, to damp down people's sweat because they're not sweating under the lights. They're LEDs, you know? Yeah, I agree. I was even telling Brando that other shoot that we had, it's like seven years ago, if you wanted to have a big source light, you would have to bring 4K HMI lights. That's already like a van for one. Yeah, you got to run a Jenny for that. <laughs> yes, you have to diffuse it. You have to maybe like block off lights on it, cut lights. But right now you have like filters, you have like small AD lights who, who would put the same output, fewer people to set that up. And you still achieve the same results. Okay. Yeah. And one of the cool things about, you know, working with this Shirko is just all of the gear that we do have at the office. And in a lot of ways, I kind of look at it as you're kind of deciding of like the size of a paintbrush you kind of want to use for a particular project. And we have all this gear that can always be used. And depending on what the client's wanting, you know, there's a lot of ways to get to the end goal of a vision. And I think that's one thing that kind of keeps it fun for all of us is that there's so much gear that you know one day we might be rocking this rig and then you know on the next step we kind of switch it up but getting to explore all the gear issue is one of the perks of the job for sure what's your favorite your go-to move blake what piece of equipment are you trying to use the most that is a good question there's so many pieces of gear i would say the newest slider that we just got the eldercrone slider is so cool and it's just in line of what Gavin and Mark are saying is gear is getting so good by the minute. And, you know, you can almost never keep up with it. There's just always something new coming out every six months. And it's exciting, but it's also a lot and overwhelming to keep up with. Yeah, I've always been really, like, overwhelmed, even just by Premiere updates and After Effect updates. So I can't even imagine all the software updates of the things you own plus the new technology. Is there like a, what's the best way to try to keep up with that? Are you just watching YouTube videos? I would, I mean, for me, and you guys feel free to chime in too, but I feel like the first to report stuff is almost always Reddit for me as other filmmakers Mm. throughout the country. and, And I mean, the world really. And you know, the fact that someone else has run into this issue that you may be running through and they're there to provide you know their experience with it and there's other people chumming in so to me reddit's always so useful because it's almost quicker in some ways than going to the main manufacturer's website to find out what i need to do wow um yeah so let's back up we got so in the weeds so quickly about all this equipment stuff but i guess let's go back to basics so that if i'm a client trying to figure out what i need to do to prep for you guys to show up brando maybe you can break down what is a site visit and why is it important Yeah, that's a great question. So a site visit is basically a field trip to the location before we actually have a day that we're filming so that we can get a lay of the land. We usually bring a camera, a stills camera to take pictures of different spaces that we like that we think are going to work for certain interview setups. Um, We can ask a lot of questions to the people who are there and we can get a feel for what sounds and what lighting is going to be present uh, throughout those days. So the things that we're really looking for are quiet spaces. If we're doing an interview with either great lighting originally that we can supplement or that we can have a lot of control over the lighting. So places that are a little bit darker or don't have as many windows that we have to black out so that we can bring in our own lighting and control every aspect of that. So, and ideally if we're, trying to go for that cinematic look or a little bit of bokeh we want to have a longer length of room so that our interview subject is not close to the wall when we're going through the site uh, it it gives us all the uh, time in the world to ask questions and look at these things in in greater depth and to try out some of the ideas in our heads what everything is going to look like and how much equipment we can bring into the space because oftentimes, we, if we do get pictures from the client, it's misleading as to how large it will be and what our footprint of our equipment can be when we bring it in. So a site visit is really important so that our experts can be on the ground and take a look at 
what the space can hold and what it can have in it. Right. Or they fail to mention that the just off the side of the picture, there's a refrigerator or <laughs> AC oh, unit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the worst. When you have um, like a noisy conference room or like a break room right outside of their, their favorite interview spot, it's not going to work. Yeah. So what are some... So whether or not they get a site visit, but it, it is a luxury depending on time and budget. Um, if you are a client and you they expect you to walk in and start filming, what's some stuff they want to keep in mind? Like noisy AC units. I know once we were, um, they were so proud of themselves. The client had gotten this big window filled um, conference room and they had booked it for the whole day, but they didn't book the conference room right next to it, which had a kind of a, one of those fake walls and they were having a pizza party. And so it was just oh my God. <laughs> a day of interviews with people screaming next door. No, that's um, yeah. What are, some, what are some other things that someone who's not a film expert might not realize are a big deal? Kind of piggybacking off what Mark said um, about being lightweight. You know, if we're in a conference room or a company's office, a lot of the times there's multiple floors that their offices are on or things mm. like that. Somewhere to put our equipment while we're setting up the shop. That's sort of like called the staging area, whether that's like a storage closet or an office that isn't being used. Um, making sure that, that that we have time to kind of move from one location to the next, even within the office. You know, that's always a big chunk out of the day to make sure we have all our equipment. Um, just being able to use our time wisely and move from setup to setup. Oh, yeah. And uh, mobile furniture is so underrated. When we go to a location and we have the ability to move the furniture that's in the space, that's a huge win. It definitely is. I mean, it is the small things like that. I know me and Mark were on a shoot last year um, where it probably took us close to about 20 minutes to move this table to and fro just to try to get things set up. And it is those like little things that you're not even thinking of. I mean, even the small things of like how to get in the building and who we're contacted and what floor we're going to. Mm. All that stuff with the site visit is just, you know, the the efficiency that that translates to on set when we're actually there for shoot day is always, I mean, like you said, of course, budget limitations and everything like that. But it's definitely one of those luxuries that makes things just run that much more smooth on the day of. That's a great point, too. And it would be good, um, Blake or whoever, if you want to break down sort of the timing of things, because I think people think they're just going to sit down like they would for a conversation and bounce right out in 20 minutes. And uh, that's rarely how it goes. So by the time you guys show up, what's how does the timing kind of work out? Well, I think the first one of the first lessons that was taught to me when I first got into this line of work is that a lot of video production or film or whatever you're doing, it's a lot of hurry up and waiting, Ish. you know, hurrying up to the site. And then it is a lot of waiting. There's a lot of stalling. And even if we have a site visit and everything, we know exactly what we're going to do, just given the amount of equipment that we have to haul in and set up. You know, that's one section of it. But then it's also, you know, checking in with the client while we're there, making sure everything's still aligning with their vision and that we're still on the same page with them. On top of all of that is really the technical stuff that comes into play with our cameras. Uh, really dialing in our settings and making sure everything's looking crystal clear and making sure that the products come and help like how we intended it to it is it, it's a lot of setting up and really the actual act, the doing the interview process or capturing b-roll really goes pretty fast but it's the same thing when you're thinking about you know large production movies of just how long it takes to do one single scene is you know a lot longer than i think people have in the back of their heads to get into it not to discourage anybody from it, it's it's really just the nature of the work. I always feel like I'm evangelizing for lighting, and I've seen Mark do some really awesome setups in the last uh, few social posts that you've made, Bree. I'm kind of curious to hear how you approach that, Mark. Actually, it's just imagination. Um, most of it comes from, most of the technical things comes from just working on, on the field for a long time, but what leads to it, it's just imaginations. Now that we had this new branding, I felt like I feel like we have so much capability to explore things, play with light. Brando would come up with something with like, oh, I want to do this colored background. And then I, I could pitch up and say like, okay, maybe we could bounce it off the mirror and then make it look cool. So these are the things that's just like banking on my head for, for a few years. And then I just had this opportunity to do that now. Yeah, you guys have been doing such cool work. It's, but yeah, to Gavin's point, especially with lighting, but it sounds like it's a really cool collaboration where what if and yes and and 
seeing what comes out. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the things that's really undervalued too, is just having more people on set just brings more people with their ideas and bouncing off each other's creativity where, you know, you have a lot of, you know, of course we go through pre-production, we have shot lists and all this stuff, but in the heat of the moment, when something hits you, and you know, one of us, you know, notices something that we can play on each other's ideas and just inspiration is in that way is something I love about Ishtra Code too. Mm. Uh, well, Blake brought up B-roll. So let's talk a little bit about what B-roll is and what dictates what the B-roll should be. Yeah, I can jump in on this one. So B-roll is the things we cut away from to give the video context. That context can either be complementary or contrasting to what is being said. So B-roll is this ability to fill the viewer in on um, more visually what's happening outside of just what the audio is telling you. And the ability for B-roll to be legitimately anything gives you the possibility to branch out into other mediums. It could be graphics, it could be uh, other video, it could be um, found footage, um, it could be news articles and photos. So that, that's where B-roll comes in and the possibilities are really endless with that. That was a great definition. <laughs> I guess this, this comes back to the client and preparing and planning. Um, if they know exactly what the end goal is for the video, then they may have some of those assets already pre-prepared. And we might know where we're going to place B-roll into the storyline to give the viewer context. But if they don't, then we may be influenced by the content that we capture on set in the form of interviews so that when we hear something that makes sense, we can go and film the B-roll later, whether that's um, working in the office or the camaraderie or whatever, we can we can go ahead and do that after secondarily. I think, Brando, um, something I love about what you're saying about the B-roll is it's really good to have intentionality. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes where we're on set and maybe we're doing a lot of interviews that day, a lot of quick hits, man on the street style interviews. And, you know, we've budgeted, they say, oh, well, and then we'll have 20 minutes or 30 minutes for B-roll at the end of the day. And that's that's fine. We can grab stuff if that's the, that's the amount of time we have. But B-roll really shines when you have some intentionality, like Brando said, either doing a little bit of planning or shot listing or storyboarding even in pre-production mm -hmm. or having a rough cut and saying, oh, it would be so great if we could get together for another shoot day or a half day and, and grab some of these shots. You know, the intentionality behind it is where you really get to be creative in the edit and always ends up a lot better. We need more time <laughs> to do these things <laughs> is what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, bring us in earlier on the projects and... It won't cost any more money. It just will help us prepare and get a feel for what needs to happen before that due date. Yeah, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but Anthony always says, like, we're you're not paying us by the hour you're paying us to set up. So if we're already going, let's take advantage. Like, where's the CEO? Maybe we can do like an end of year thing. Like, we're here. We're in the building. The difference, though, in what you're getting for your money is either getting one camera or two. So can someone sort of break down when one camera is fine or when you'll definitely want two cameras? I think that two cameras is usually the recommendation. One camera works for, I said, man on the street style interview earlier. That's sort of if somebody has a direct to camera address, if you are trying to pull a lot of people perhaps at a conference, or if there's an event where a lot of people are gathered, you can kind of do it very quickly, have somebody talk directly to the camera. That's when they're looking directly at the lens. So it feels like they're looking at the audience. Um, a lot more of the projects uh, I feel like that we do are two camera, or at least, again, that's what we recommend. That allows you to, I mean, Brandon, you explained this in one of our posts earlier, right? That allows us to edit and be more creative. <laughs> I did, yeah. Mark wrote the script. So Mark being the expert, he defined what the magic is is um it's not actual magic it's just when you make a mistake there's always a second camera to cut to to make sure that we can cover the mistake in the magic of editing yet yeah, i think it comes down to limitations too and you know like gavin said you can do some main on the street you can do anything we could do anything we wanted really kind of one camera but it's the limitations you run into when you're getting into post-production or even on the day of with that one camera and then on top of that, the two camera, I always think it's 
it just gives so much more leeway to get extra creative with two different angles rather than just the one where you kind of have to nail down, you know, this person needs to be in frame and say what they need to say, where if we have multiple camera angles, each of those camera angles can kind of be inflicted in a different emotion or whatever we're trying to pull out of the subject. Yeah, that's true. Uh, also, not only that, uh, not only that it looks good in the interview, it's also a good way for us to split the team. Like right after the interview, one camera can go catch a B-roll that's happening on the other room. It's great to have those kinds of functionality. It eliminates the wild card too. Like say, for example, a client would come up on set while we're, while we're setting up in the interview and would bring up a poster on the from behind, like, oh, include this as the branding, stuff like that. Having those two cameras, like we can have one wide catching that and then still stick with the close up on the other camera. So yeah, it's the, the 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 more camera, the better. Awesome. Yeah, that's something that's definitely universal across the production team. Is we're always down with more cameras rather than less. <laughs> Is there a setup that you wish more clients could take advantage of? Is there something that you could utilize more to make more interesting videos? I mean, I can chime in a little bit. Just, I think some of the, you know, social videos that we've been putting out, we've really, you know, tried to put a focus on using more color in the lighting and moving light. Just some of these different elements that I think sometimes clients don't even know are at their disposal that we can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the idea is putting out work like that on our social team is more to show clients of what we can do. It's all imaginative, right? If you can come up with this vision, we have the team and we have the capability to usually bring it to light. There's so many different ways to tell your story too. I feel like probably all of us are always getting to, you know, try something new and do a different setup for a client. I think um, as a creative, it's just so fun when a client also has that kind of open-mindedness. When given the opportunity to be more creative, we are always going to be more invested in the project. And you're bringing up a great point about brainstorming at the beginning. A lot of people are just like, we'll deal with it when you get here. We're just going to we set up the interviews and then that'll be that. And we'll make a video. But taking that second to think about format and who's being interviewed and why, I think that really can add a lot to the level of production. Totally. This was so helpful. I think this is a really good starting point if someone's interested in video or even thinking about video and curious as to why they should do it. Thank you guys for taking the time and jumping on here. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us, Bree. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bree. Thank you, Bree. And thank you all for tuning in. We'd love to hear from you. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you all in two weeks.